Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I've done a guest video for Godless Cranium, and if you're not already subscribed to him, then I highly recommend that you head over to his channel and check him out. He puts out some great content. So here's my video that I did for him. Hello, Godless Craniards, Vice Rhino here. GC was feeling a bit lazy today, so he asked me to fill in for him. So today, you get to watch the Rhino with the psychedelic background attempt to educate some creationists. So let's go! I know they haven't actually said anything yet, but I did look up this high school in an attempt to find out if these guys actually had permission to film their exterior. I couldn't find anything either way, but this high school's sports teams are referred to as the Flying Fleckos. And I think it can be said that the authors of this propaganda piece didn't give a flying flecko about accuracy. I know that the last two weeks that we've been talking about evolution has been really tough for some of you. I understand that some of you are raised in families that don't believe in evolution for religious reasons. But in my class, I try to teach you to think for yourself. Are there any questions? There is no way any biology teacher would ever say this in a classroom. The only time anything like this might actually come up is if a student were to bring up creationism, and then the teacher would be explaining that the student has a right to believe that, but they need to accurately teach our understanding of biology, which all points to evolution. Now that being said, he is being quite reasonable. They come so close to self-awareness here, and they never address the fact that creationism is about parroting a few bad ideas without thought, and science is about thinking for yourself. They just never address that, they just leave it hanging. No questions? Kayla, you've been unusually quiet. You always have challenges for me. In an actual classroom, that would have been more like, no questions? Okay then, moving on. Teachers have a lot to get through in the term, and they don't have time to waste trying to convince kids to ask questions that, to all appearances, they don't even have. Uh, no, that's okay. But, but, but I know there's a God. I felt him. You can't explain my entire faith away with just a couple of chapters from the science book. Mark... Feelings can be compelling, but also very misleading. Now, I don't mind if you have faith in your God, but science doesn't require faith. It requires evidence. Anyone else? Again, he's being very reasonable. He, was, he sounded a bit condescending there, and that was a bit unnecessary, but yeah, you can believe in a God if you want, but science is about evidence, and like it or not, the evidence points to evolution. Well, it seems to me that that's just what's missing from the whole idea of evolution. What's missing? I'm going to take this moment to warn you. She is about to do a creationist favorite, the Gish Gallop. This is when they bring up so many arguments in such a short time frame that it's hard to address all of them. And even if the opponent addresses most of them perfectly, they will then latch on to the ones that were missed and declare that those ones couldn't be addressed, therefore they don't have the answer, therefore God. They particularly like this method in situations where their opponent has a limited amount of time, such as formal debates. Evidence. Evidence is missing. It just seems that it takes much more faith to believe in evolution than to believe in a designer. Yes, absolutely. It takes much more faith to believe in what we can see, test, and predict than it does to believe in magic. Do you have any examples? Well, how about when the textbook talks about the law of biogenesis? How life cannot come from non-life, but then in the next chapter it talks about how all life sprung from non-living material. Biogenesis is not a law in the same sense that Newton's laws of motion are laws. In fact, the only sources I could find that refer to it as a law were creationist ones. The rest simply call it biogenesis. Basically, biogenesis was the term coined to counter the hypothesis of spontaneous generation, in which it was thought that maggots and mold essentially came out of nowhere. It was used to describe how organisms don't just pop out of existence from nothing, as would have been the case if creationism were true. It says nothing of the development of life from organic molecules, which is covered by abiogenesis. And then it talks about mutation and natural selection and how it can change one animal into another, but mutation only loses information and natural selection can only choose from what's there. So how does a simple living organism turn into something like us? 
There are several well-documented instances of mutations adding information. The easiest way, but not the only way, for a mutation to result in more genetic information is for a gene to first be duplicated, which happens all the time. These duplicated genes are then free to evolve in different directions without impacting the original function of the gene. The fact that most people watching this are not lactose intolerant is a direct result of mutation being added into the genome, allowing people to digest milk into adulthood. There are also two separate groups of monkeys which have independently evolved a new protein known as TRIM5-CYP-A, which protects against HIV. It's a mutation which has resulted in a new protein with a new function, hence new information. I mean, you have to think about, like, the complexity of the human eye and how we could never design something like that. How do you know that we could never design something like that? Optics are a fairly new scientific field, with cameras only just being invented 200 years ago. And we're making huge amounts of progress in the field, with the first 8K resolution monitor now available to the public. The 33 me megapixels in 8K resolution is still a far cry from the 3 to 500 megapixel range for our eyes, depending on who you ask, but we're getting there. And in some ways, modern cameras are much better than our eyes already, as the whole image taken with any modern camera will be in full color, while our vision only sees color in about a 55 degree arc. Now the reason you seem to see color in your peripheral vision is because our brains are very good at guesswork. In fact, roughly half of what you're seeing at any given moment is your brain guessing at what it thinks should be there. There's also the matter of the optic nerve crossing the retina, giving us a nice little blind spot, where again, the brain has to compensate for lack of information. I've never seen a camera where they purposely have some sort of obstruction before the sensor, which then has to be processed and guessed at what should have been in that area. You know, that's just not a feature that they come with. Now, basically, when it comes down to it, though, the eye is not really comparable to a camera, because the goals are different. The eye's purpose is to provide a stream of information which your brain then uses to make decisions, while a camera's purpose is to make a visual record of something you may wish to see again. From a purely information collecting viewpoint, we have developed a wide range of sensors that are arguably more efficient at collecting the relevant information than our eyes. And science is always progressing while religion remains largely static. So what will you say when in, say, the next 30 to 50 years, we develop a camera with a higher resolution than the eye? You say it can't be done, but someone 300 years ago might have said the same thing of the idea of a camera, especially a digital one, simply because the science wasn't there yet. So I'll just dub this one the argumentum ad we haven't done it yet -yum fallacy. Or how, how the human body can heal itself. Ah, uh, another favorite fallacy of creationists, the argument from I don't get it. You not understanding something does not make that thing false. So here's a grossly oversimplified version of how blood clotting evolved. White blood cells would have evolved first, which was beneficial because they're sticky. Think pus. That stuff is gross and sticky, and it's basically just white blood cells. So they help stop bleeding initially. They would kind of just, as they're flowing by the wounds, they would just kind of get stuck on the edges, and then they'd stick together. And it didn't work great, but, you know, it's a good start, and it would have helped a bit. Secondly, when a wound is inflicted, the injured cells basically dump all of their contents, including their signaling chemicals, into the bloodstream. One of those chemicals, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or CAMP, triggers a contraction of smooth muscle cells, which are the kind of cells found in blood vessels. So at this first stage, we have two already developed items, white blood cells and CAMP, which work together to contract the blood vessels around the wound site, which restricts the blood flow and also increases the likelihood that a white blood cell would get stuck there. Now, long story short, a gene controlling a digestive enzyme produced in the pancreas was duplicated and mutated so that an inactive form of the enzyme is al also produced in the liver. Now, this enzyme becomes activated by some of the material dumped from a damaged cell, and the result is enhanced clotting. There's much more to the story than that, but I would like to keep this video a bit shorter than a college semester, so I'll post the link down below for you if you want more details. I just don't understand how some half-pound insect-eating shrew that somehow dodged whatever killed the dinosaurs could evolve from ape to ape-man over millions of unseen years, and then poof, you have humans! Well, since the most likely cause of dinosaur extinction was climate change in the form of clouds of dust and gas, which were being spewed forth by volcanoes and also ejected from the asteroid impact, uh, that would have actually resulted mostly in the plant species going extinct. However, all animals, carnivores and herbivores alike, ultimately rely on plants for their food. 
Since dinosaurs were so large, they needed an incredibly large amount of plant material in order to keep them alive. Smaller animals, such as shrew-like mammals, would have had a much better advantage as they don't require nearly the amount of plant material for survival. And then the 65 million years since then were plenty of time for those shrew-like mammals to develop into the large array of mammals we see today. And as a side note, some small dinosaurs survive too. Today we know them as birds. If evolution were true, we'd have millions of in-between creatures running around everywhere, right? Right. And we do. But I assume that you want to ignore the fact that every animal alive is technically a transitional species, and you just want to focus on the ones that are in the in-between stages of developing something large-scale like wings, lungs, or sex. Well, we have flying squirrels and snakes for wings, we have mudskippers for lungs, and we have species of algae that have very primitive forms of sex. And those are living animals, and plants in the algae's case. There are plenty more examples of extinct transitional species. And all of the in-between fossils could fit in the back of my Prius. First, you're dead wrong. There are dozens of fossils on the Wikipedia list of transitional fossils, and several are larger than your Prius by themselves. Second, even if you were right, that is an admission that transitional fossils exist, which means that at some point there were animals transitioning between the species, which means that evolution is true. So thanks for that. And you know what else? I just don't understand how all of this started. I mean, you say that science doesn't rely on faith, but evolution requires faith. Faith that everything just burst out of nothing. And now you're dragging cosmology into a biology class? That's a bit outside the scope of what he's supposed to be teaching you, don't you think? You don't have to understand where the universe came from in order to understand how things work within the universe. And even if you did, that is once again the argument from, I don't get it, therefore it can't be true. Why, a four-year-old child could understand this report. Run out and find me a four-year-old child. I can't make head or tail out of it that gas clouds collapsed and turned into stars, and all this stuff just collided around the sun to create planets, including Earth. All those things have been well documented and are well understood, but not necessarily by your biology teacher. So go ask an astronomer and you will get an excellent explanation. That is just the right distance away from the sun to sustain life. To sustain life as we know it. That's like saying, isn't it amazing that the water in this puddle just happened to conform exactly to the shape of the hole that it's in? There could very well be life out there that evolved in a habitat that is completely inhospitable to humans, or water in a different puddle to continue the analogy. And they may well be asking the same question about their planet that is much too far away from their star for human life. It requires faith to believe that living organisms created male and female, crawled out of the water, and then magically became land-dwelling animals, which then became humans. We have some fairly decent ideas about how sex evolved. It did not require the simultaneous fully formed evolution of male and female as we know it. It most likely started with small differences possibly in a single gene, which simply differentiated between whether a cell produced sperm or eggs. Over time, this became more complex form of sex that we know today. This is well documented in certain algae species. As far as magically becoming land-dwelling animals, there's nothing magical about it. I've already mentioned the mudskipper, which is an excellent example of a species that is currently evolving in the direction of moving out of the water and onto the land. After that, all that's required is natural selection, and presto, a few billion years later, we have humans. But please keep in mind, humans are not and never have been the goal of evolution. Evolution has no goals. We are a transitional species on its way to something else, and nobody knows what that something else will look like in another few million years, assuming we don't go extinct before evolving to the next species. All without intelligence or design? Yep. If someone designed our bodies, then they would be fired for gross negligence. What with our eyes wired backwards, our laryngeal nerve taking a detour through, through the aortic arch, our tendency to develop cancer, all the genetic disorders that we're prone to, all of which make perfect sense in the light of evolution, but in the creationist worldview, leaving us wondering how an omnipotent and omniscient being could possibly be so incompetent. I just think it takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe that all the design, marvelous design around us points to a designer. Your use of the word design does not automatically imply a designer. 
There are patterns all around us, yes, but all the evidence points to them arising naturally. If you want to put your God in the gaps of our scientific knowledge, that's your prerogative. But what you're currently doing is distorting and ignoring science to make your version of God fit into a gap that's no longer there. And now I'm just rambling, so does anyone else have a question? And there you have it, the glorious completion of the Gish Gallop. So many questions that it has taken me 13 minutes to give partial answers to all of them, but your poor teacher didn't have a chance to address a single one before the bell rang, making it look like he's incompetent and sending those poor kids home with a distorted impression of what evolution is. Had that occurred at the beginning of the class, he would have had enough time to patiently explain all the points just like he was doing at the beginning of the video. The good guy of this promo it looks like a complete jerk, while the bad guy, evolution teacher, looks like someone who just wants kids to know the truth and how to think for themselves, but he was overwhelmed with way too many questions right at the end of class. That's a good summary of religion for you. The bad guys are the ones who want you to think for yourself. Anyways, that's it for this video. I would like to thank Godless Cranium for having me on. If you liked this, you can check out my YouTube channel. This is Vice Rhino, signing off.